All right, for our second video about section 1.3, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Last time we saw how the fundamental theorem of calculus helped us compute integrals by telling us that if you want to take an integral of some function, you can reverse the process of taking the derivative and then plug in some numbers. Uh, so we kind of developed this intuition that if you take the integral of a derivative, you get back the original function in some sense. So now what we want to do is we want to talk about well, what happens if you do it in the other order? What if you take a derivative of an integral? And so we want to first think about what that means. So maybe the, the first thing that you would want to write down when we're talking about taking the derivative of an integral uh, might be something like, you might say, well, what's ddx of the integral from a to b of f of x dx? But the first thing that I want to point out here is that this thing that we're taking the derivative of, well, even though it looks like it has some x's in there, this thing is actually a number. Right, this uh, quantity here inside the derivative, this integral, it's some area. It's some amount of space that uh, the, the, between the curve f of x and the x-axis. So it's just a constant number, and so this uh, derivative is guaranteed to be zero, no matter what f of x is. So, okay, so that, that seems like a very boring approach to uh, this to this question of what does it mean to take the derivative of an integral and it's certainly not one that we want to think about right now it's not not a very helpful approach to this question so this isn't going to be what we want to think about instead what we want to think about is maybe instead of writing the upper limit of integration as b maybe we want to uh, use a different letter i don't know we could use the letter x so we could think about the integral from a to x of, and since I am using x as my upper limit of integration, I probably don't also want to use x in the integrand uh, because that's a little bit confusing. So we'll call this f of t dt. Uh, an important thing to note here is that whatever comes after the d should be the variable here of f. Um, that's really what this, uh, at least one of the purposes of, of this dt here, is to tell you what the variable of integration is. So if I'm integrating a function of t, then I'd better have a dt here. All right. So anyways, so maybe, maybe what we can notice here is that this thing that I've just written down is a function of x. For every x value that I give you, maybe I give you the x value 1, maybe I give you the x value of 10, you can sit down and compute actually what this integral is. And that's exactly what it means to be a function. It means that given some input, x, then uh, it gives you some output number. And that's exactly what this does. Geometrically, what this uh, represents is if we have our function f of x here, and I have a being fixed, or my function f of t here, then um, this function a of x represents the area under the curve between a and x. So you, uh, as you vary x, the amount of area changes, and so you can think about that as a function. It's a function which measures the amount of area between a and x. So great, we have, we have some function of x here, and that means that it's pretty reasonable to talk about a derivative of it. So that's sort of the thing that we want to explore right now. Uh, what exactly is a prime of x here? And this is the question that we'll look at. So let's see. So example four is giving us a uh, sample, sample function here. We've got f of t equals cosine of t. And here we're going to call it big F of x uh, rather than a of x, uh, but it's the same idea that we had earlier uh, with this a of x. Um, I typically prefer to call them a rather than big F because it gets confusing if I start talking about F as to which one I'm referring to, um, but it's more common notation to talk about big F for this function, so uh, I'm going to use that so at least you see it a little bit during these videos. 
So part A is just asking us compute f of pi. So that's uh, fairly straightforward. So this means replace all of my x's by pi's. So I have uh, the integral from 0 to pi here of cosine of t dt. And in order to compute this integral, I want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says find an antiderivative of cosine, meaning I want to think about whose derivative is cosine. And I remember, oh, the derivative of sine is cosine. So I'm going to put my antiderivative here, sine of t, and I want to evaluate it from 0 to pi. So this means compute sine of pi minus sine of 0. Uh, I know that sine of pi is 0, sine of 0 is 0, and so this whole, uh, this, this number ends up being 0 here. So f of pi is 0. We can do a similar computation here uh, if we're computing f of pi over 4. And this means, again, replace all of my x's in my formula for big F by pi over 4. So I'm now looking at the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of cosine of t dt. And the process here is exactly the same. We find an antiderivative for cosine, so we can pick sine. We evaluate from the lower endpoint to the upper endpoint, so 0 to pi over 4. And then we compute sine of pi over 4 minus sine of 0. And let's see, so sine of pi over 4 is the square root of 2 out of 2. Sine of 0 is 0, and so we end up finding that this is the square root of 2 out of 2. So again, a uh, nice computation that we can do here. Part C is asking us to come up with a simpler formula for f of x. We certainly have a formula right now, but maybe we want to think a little bit about how we could simplify the writing here. So if we think about what f of x is here, well, it's the integral from 0 to x of cosine of t dt. And we notice that no matter what x value I have, the process is exactly the same find an antiderivative of cosine, and then evaluate at the endpoints. The antiderivative of cosine uh, we can always take to be sine. My endpoints here are 0 and x. Even though we don't know what x is, we can still evaluate at it. So if I plug x into sine, well, I get sine of x, uh, and then I'm subtracting away sine of 0. And sine of 0 is 0, so this is always going to give me sine of x. So what I find here is that this complicated function, which is defined by some integral, uh, is actually has a much simpler representation as sine of x. So what does this mean we can do? Well, it means that with this simple uh, formula, we can actually compute f prime of x. So big F prime of x is going to be the derivative of this formula that we had here. Uh, we know the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. And, uh, well, we notice that, in fact, this is exactly little f of x. So the evidence that we're seeing here is that if I start with this uh, function, this, uh, so I start with this little f, I create this big F determined by taking the integral, and then I take its derivative, I end up with the original function that I started with. In other words, if the first thing that I do is integrate little f, and then I take a derivative of the resulting function that I get, I get out the function that I started with. So uh, certainly we, we haven't proved that, we've only looked at one case, but uh, hopefully it seems plausible at least that, that this is what's going on. And in fact, uh, we have the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is going to tell us just that. It says that if f of t is a continuous function, then the function a of x equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt has a prime of x equal to f of x. So the intuition that I want to develop here and that I want to talk about is that this is the reverse order of the thing that we were just talking about. In some sense, it says that the derivative of the integral of some function, uh, I guess we can say dt here, c 
somehow gives us back the original function. So again, this is intuition. This is not a formal statement by any means, um, but it is kind of nice to, to, have this, to have this notion. So there's this question of, okay, well, you know, I, I mean, sure, doing an integral and then a derivative, uh, if that gives you back the original function, it certainly seems like doing a derivative and an integral would give you back the original function. But maybe this is at least a little bit surprising, and uh, for reasons uh, that I'll kind of make this analogy here. So the analogy that I want to make is to squaring and square rooting. So notice that if I start with with some func or with some number, um, so maybe maybe I start with the number five, and then I take the square root of it, and then I square. Uh, let's see, so I, I take the square root of 5 and then I square it, I get 5 back out. So in other words, uh, square root and then squaring gives me back the original thing that I started with. However, the reverse process isn't always true, right? If I start with the number, let's say, minus 5, and then I square it, I get 25 out. And then I square root it, I get positive 5 back out, which is not the original thing. So here what we see is that uh, square squaring and then square rooting does not give you back the original. So this is kind of the analogy that we want to think about here. And in fact, what we see is that integrals and derivatives are better than squares and square roots in the sense that what we just learned of the two parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus that we have uh, say that integral and then doing a derivative, that gets you back the original function. And a derivative and then an integral, that also gets you back the original function. So derivatives and integrals work both ways, um, and they cancel out each other no matter which order you do them in. Whereas with squaring and square roots, uh, one particular order is kind of tricky because it might not get you back the original thing that you started with.